Thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, speak with you and congratulations to Oxford Brooks on your 125 years and counting. Um, it's really good to see you and taking your own time at this late hour as the nights draw in to spend time with me and it's nice to see two very good friends in the audience, uh, Jane Appleton who uh, trained with me at Sheffield Polytechnic as it was then and uh, my very good friend Olga Kozlowska who um, worked with me at Wolverhampton and who has travelled across from Oxford from the hospitals to tonight. So thanks to my friends but thanks to all of you for your time. Um, when I was asked to do this I kind of had a bit of a, a moment where you know there's so much to say and what should you say kind of thing um, and thinking about nursing past and present I thought it would be a good opportunity to talk about both my kind of professional and my personal experience of moving through this nursing journey is probably the way I would put it. So I decided to focus on the importance of diversity and diversity leadership because I felt that that embodied both my personal experience and also my professional one. So. In the time that I have today, I want to talk to you about my experience and I want to talk to you about the past, the present and the future. Um, and I've called the um, presentation Waiting to Exhale and hopefully by the time we get to the end of it, you will uh, understand why. Okay. So my first question really is, what makes me or what makes us a nurse? What is it about nursing? Is it how we sit by the bedside and support people in their hour of need? Is it about our work in the community with the elderly and older people, making sure they maintain their health and remain as independent as possible? Or is it our focus on the future and the next generation? Is it how we educate children to be in inspired, to be aware of how their choices inform their health and their life in the future? Or is it about the science and the art of our profession? The truest reflection of our art, at the privilege point at the end of somebody's life, where we are the person or we are the people who get to spare time and spend time helping people through that final, most precious journey? Or is it about the science of our profession, about how we teach and inform and research and evidence nursing practice and the next generation of nursing practitioners. For me, in my experience professionally and personally, it's all these things. When we talk about diversity in nursing, we must first start to think about what it means to be a nurse and the diversity of practice. The range and scope of the NMC um, license allows us to practice our nursing in hospitals, in communities. It allows us to practice our nursing through the art of care. It allows us to practice our nursing through the science of research, the science of education, and all those things and opportunities through the science and art of policy and politics. This is nursing and this is the diversity which I speak of. Diversity, of course, is much more recognized within the personal and professional experiences of human beings. And what I want to do, as I said, is to share my personal and professional kind of views, experiences, challenges and opportunities with you, both as a black woman and as a clinical academic. And both those parts reflect the personal and the professional aspects of who I am and what I believe to be important. In my journey, I'm going to introduce you to a range of giants. These giants here, some of will be more familiar to you than others, they reflect the people who've inspired me through my journey so far. Some of them have affected me positively and some of them have affected me negatively. But all of them have had some influence on how I became who I am and continue to be. And I will introduce them to you as we go along. You'll recognize the giants because they're most of the time, when I've remembered, they're in blue type. So you'll see. And I will name some of them. And those of you who may see on this list names that you don't recognize, I would um, encourage you to look a few of them up. 
When we think about diversity and culture and health, we must remember that actually this is part of the whole experience of healthcare practice and the work of healthcare professionals. Kona in 2003, who was a midwife, talked about the importance of diversity, culture and health to, to our experiences of professionals, but also to the experiences of people who use services. And what she said was, there is no encounter, there is nothing that we do, nothing that happens between healthcare professionals and patients or clients that doesn't mean working with difference. So when we think about diversity, we must think beyond just cultural diversity. We must think beyond just, well, everybody here looks like me and think that actually we're re re uh, sorry, we are relating to each other as human beings and that means we are different. Unfortunately, what she found at the time was that it's still the most neglected part of training for healthcare professionals. So despite its importance, it's not something that we prioritize. Sometimes we focus too much on one aspect of our professionalism, the science of clinical practice. And sometimes we look at the art of clinical practice without thinking about the human relationships that occur in that, in that sphere. So what about me then? Here I stand, and as I was introduced as a selection of things that I have done, but I would say predominantly I'm a clinical academic who's a researcher. And I research diversity, I research difference, and I research opportunities to make things better and give people better life chances. But research is always a challenging career choice, and those of you in the audience who are researchers will hopefully agree. It's not, despite what people think, it's not an easy ride. It's a constant cyclical activity. You're only as good as your last paper and your last successful grant. So it's a challenge to do. On top of that, for me, to focus on ethnicity and race around health are also difficult. It's almost like layering another level, level of difficulty on top. Because the challenge around doing ethnicity and race and diversity is that it makes people uncomfortable. It makes people who fund research uncomfortable. It makes people who listen to research uncomfortable. And it makes your colleagues uncomfortable. And to do that research as a black woman makes people even more uncomfortable because there's a fear of saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing. And so the challenge is always there personally and professionally for me in doing this work. And despite the diversity of the United Kingdom and society now, it, race, ethnicity are still challenging things which actually make people feel uncomfortable. On the next layer, race and ethnicity are not things in and of themselves. When we have social, social disadvantage that intersects with race and ethnicity and other areas of difference, it makes, a, makes even more of a social impact. It makes it even more difficult to feel comfortable in that sphere. And I think for me, not feeling comfortable is something that I'm kind of used to. And so it becomes almost inevitable that that was going to be part of my work. And you'll see as we move forward that even in my clinical choice, there was a degree of uncomfortableness about it, which I chose. Not always willingly, I have to say. And so because of this uncomfortable scenario that we find research in, and the uncomfortable scenario that we find research that focuses on race, ethnicity, difference or diversity, then instead of actually working to increase our evidence around these things, we instead sanitize our actions. It's a lot easier to focus on policy and documentation around these things and count the beans than it is to deal with the uncomfortableness of talking to people about their experience and their disadvantage. And so for many sensitive areas of research, We've, we are very good at the science. We know the how many. We know the quantitative measures of difference. But the qualitative exploration is somewhere that makes us feel very uncomfortable to go. And so we sanitize our evidence and avoid it and avoid dealing with it. It's not so long ago that when we think about race and ethnicity, we remember that 
things were not always even as comfortable as they are now, that people were disadvantaged by nature of belonging to a specific group, that people were excluded because they did not fit into society's beliefs of what should or should not be. And even in the subtleness, people were excluded because they weren't exactly how we wanted them to be. And these were the headlines not that long ago. But behind all those headlines, behind those policies, behind those stories, were families, individuals, communities, people who were silenced, people whose stories were not told, and people who suffered because of their difference. The title of your, your series of talks, Looking Back and Looking Forward, charges us to not forget the past, to not forget this, because it's so easy for us to slip back into that arena. Those of you who are interested and up-to-date with the news will know as we cast our eyes across the pond, similar reactions are not so far away. In human experience, in human history, we over and over and over again repeat this scenario. And so that's why, for me, researching in this area is important. It's important professionally and it's important personally in order that the cycles that we go around do not forever get smaller and smaller until they choke us. One of my giants on the list was Audrey Lord who, for those of you who've ever heard me speak previously, I speak of her a lot. And I'll speak of her again before we get to the end. Audre Lorde talked a lot about the importance of voicing your story, the importance of speaking or helping those to speak who cannot speak for themselves. She was very concerned that actually it wasn't history that actually stopped us from doing things. So the previous slide demonstrating the history of difference, the history of exclusion. It's not that that stops us moving forward, but often it's silence around those issues. And she said, it's not history which immobilizes us. And the key point here for me in her quote is, it's silence. And there are so many silences to be broken. And so through the rest of this presentation, I want to unearth, and, 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 oh, I want to unearth those silences and silences for you. As professionals, we are constantly presented with silence. As researchers, we search for answers for the things that don't exist. But one of the key things for us as a professional group, as nurses or healthcare practitioners, is what do we do with that information? What do we do when we find out that evidence? Jensen talks about how professions are constituted and actually says that what makes us a professional group is actually what we do, how we find about, out about things and what we do with that knowledge. So we're constituted with how we deal with knowledge. Within nursing and healthcare, it's important that we understand through a science and art that knowledge can be hard knowledge, measured in outputs, measured in data, but knowledge is also soft knowledge, measured in experiences, in stories, in opinions and viewpoints. And with nurses, we're fortunate that we are actually engaged with both types of knowledge and both types of evidence. So how do we know what we know and what do we do about it? When we choose as nurses or as healthcare practitioners to only engage with one kind of knowledge or one type of knowledge, we restrict our knowledge base. But there is always our action. What do we do about that? What do we do with the information we have? If we have good knowledge and do nothing about it, I believe that makes us less of a professional. We actually do ourselves a disservice. For myself, when I was doing my, my PhD, one of the things that I was aware of was the amount of silences there were around the area that I studied. My work was around black Caribbean men and sexual decision making. It was about living with the stereotype. It was about how black men used or reacted to the stereotype around their sexual behavior and how clinicians did the same and how that dissuaded people or persuaded them to seek help 
to seek help for their sexually transmitted infections and for, for their decision making around sexual behaviour. And what I unearthed in that was something that I, a concept that I called screaming silences. Because I found that in a lot of the research that I was doing, I wasn't discovering new things, well, things that were not new necessarily to me, but I was actually providing evidence for things that I knew. Things that I knew because I was a member of the black community. Things that I knew because the men I spoke to were similar to my brothers, my uncles, and now my sons. So screaming silences are not about discovering brand new things. They're about finding ways to relieve the silence about the things that we know to be true, but which if we look in the books, we don't find any evidence for. So the concept I, dis uh, I developed, I defined as experiences which are historically and or politically undervalued, absent or invisible. And because of that, the, the, because of that lack of evidence around these particular experiences, what happens is that we develop policy or we develop practice in silence. We develop the policies, we develop the new ways of doing things without any acknowledgement of these other experiences actually existing. The problem is then is that is how we end up with groups, individuals and families excluded from certain types of good practice. Many of our gold standard care pathways have large silences in them around particular groups within our own society. One of the first questions I always ask is, okay, what is the profile of the area where you live? And when you look at your services, are the people within the profile of the area where you live using those services? Who walks through the door, do you know? Again, within many nursing programs that I've looked at, we talk about population epidemiology, we talk about population profiles in a vacuum. So students know the population percentages, but what does that actually mean for them in terms of who they're likely to look after, who's likely to access the services, who are they likely to care for when they're actually in their clinical practice? Universities, in some way, give a false presentation because all of us, whichever university we are, we have students from across the globe. So we actually skew the profile of a population. But when we're actually training nursing and healthcare students and they go into the hospital or they go into the community area, the profile that they are going to care for is not the university profile. How much as professionals do we use that knowledge to inform and to support those students out into practice. If we look at some of the evidence that we have from the UK around the impact of not having a diverse leadership or a diverse presentation in the health service, representation in the health service, we will see some of the consequences of a lack of action around these silences. We all know very much the work of Roger Klein around the Snow White Peaks and looking at the diversity across the NHS through the different levels up to board levels. And we all know that actually the peaks are very snowy white at the top. They're also male and snowy white at the top. Until I read his work, I'd never even thought that snow had a gender, but obviously it does. <laughs> what, you may, what you may know a little less, but which is, I think, even more interesting was that a few years before Klein, there was the work of West. And West actually looked at what were the consequences of a lack of diversity on patient experience and on the quality of care. And he says here that research suggests that the experiences of BME members of staff in the NHS are a good barometer to patient experience too. And that it's a good barometer for how well everybody within that organization feels they are treated. So in areas where BME staff reported very positive experiences of work, the whole profile of the organization was very positive. In areas where BME staff reported very low and very negative experiences at work, the profile of the, of the organization was equally low. I'm currently an, uh, one of the ambassadors of the Equality Challenge Unit and the new Race Equality Charter for Higher Education. 
and equally the data from the Equality Challenge Unit says the same thing about higher education. When you look at the experience of staff and students from minority and BME communities within higher education, they are a good barometer for the satisfaction levels of all staff within that. So it's not just about the achievement levels of BME students, it's also about the experience of BME staff and BME students that makes a difference. This is even more important within nursing and health because I believe when we look at the profile within that, we have much more of a diverse student and staff ratio than many other parts of the university. But we equally reflect the same amount of lower achievement and lower satisfaction. So it's something that we actually need to ask ourselves. How far are we repeating or reflecting the data that we see here from the NHS within our own organisations in education? So what do we do? What do we need to do? What do we need to accept? To, how do we foster diversity leadership? And when I talk about leadership, I'm not just talking about the people at the top. I'm talking about all the way through an organisation where people feel they have self-agency. They have capacity to develop and to drive their own agendas. They have capacity to influence what happens to them and influence and affect the experience of their students or their patients. In essence, this means moving away from compliance, just the science of counting, to actually promoting and valuing difference. And that means seeing it through what we do. It's not enough to give yourself a tick in the box because, well, actually, the percentage says that less than 5% of BME staff are in senior lecturer or above, but we've got so many. But how, what is the experience of those people? So it's a beyond the science of compliance and towards the art of actually enjoying and celebrating the differences between all of us. It's also about recognising individual needs as well as ensuring that people are equally valued. That doesn't mean they're equally not valued. So, you know, you can't just lower it down to the lowest common denominator. It actually means bringing everybody up. And I think that certainly within nursing and health, for me, it's about not prioritizing the patient over the member of staff. And that's probably not what people want to hear. When I did the evaluation of compassion in practice, which was a, a large part of my secondment with NHS England, one of the major failures of compassion in practice was forgetting the staff and the workforce. So it achieved what it set out to achieve, certainly in terms of increasing the patient satisfaction, increasing people, f patients feeling that they got one-to-one -one care, that they were looked after. But in the process of doing that, staffing felt worse. And this was not an issue of number. Again, contrary to what people believe in the headlines, when I spoke to nurses and midwives and care staff, and we collected over 12,500 pieces of data to do the summary. When we spoke to them, very, very few, and I mean less than 0.1%, talked about staffing numbers. They all talked about the actual balance. They talked about the quality of being able to deliver the, the, the care they wanted. They talked about being valued. They talked about having the right balance of staff, not the right number. And so it's important that in looking at diversity leadership, that we actually make sure that people can give the kind of care they came in to give as well as receive it. Prioritising one, one group in the relationship over another doesn't give you a better relationship. It also means making sure that we reflect diversity in service provision with different groups, with different service users and different service providers. So, it also, so that means reflecting a diversity of practice. Again, if you look on the NMC register, and I've, as I said right at the beginning, you can be on the register as an educator, as a researcher, as a practitioner, and you can do that practice within primary, secondary care, within mental health, within children, within learning disabilities. And yet when I reflect and think about what we often do within higher education with students, do we reflect with them 
when they get to the end, pursuing careers across that diversity? Or do we reflect pursuing a career in a hospital and maybe a few of you might go to community? So are we encouraging a diversity of practice? As we sit here as diverse practitioners, but do we then encourage students to churn out to be working in a hospital and occasionally in community? So we must reflect diversity practice in what we say as well as what we do. And how will we know when we've got there? The researcher in me says that we've got to have some points like how do we know when, not when we've done it, but at least when we're going in the right direction. And I think when we, we will reach there, when, we, when there are these things are evident, when we see equality in transcultural healthcare is more than just a colour color status, when we can understand diversity much more than whether or not somebody looks or doesn't look like you or speaks the same language as you do. I think we also will recognise it when diversity and diversity leadership permeates all the contexts where we live, both inside and outside work. So when we actually understand and appreciate our differences as something which makes us stronger, that which doesn't divide us or make us weaker. And I think when we safeguard the diversity of our workforce, I think one of the challenges that we have with the change, not from degree nursing, which was the arguments of a couple of uh, years ago, you know, when we go to all degree, it'll all change. Well, I, for one, will put my hand up and say, this year is 30 years since I graduated with a nursing degree. And so if anybody else talks to me about the new nursing degree, I think I'm going to scream again. But we need to, the diversity of our workforce in the truest sense, we, we're going to be challenged with when fees come in, when nurses are paying for training. We're going to be challenged with when we actually look at how we are going to maintain the diversity of application. I don't think we're going to struggle with number. I really don't think it's going to be a case of suddenly nobody will want to do nursing. I think we might struggle with diversity across all the spectrum, and that is a challenge we need to, to think about. And then that means that we requ we're required to do some action. We need to do something about it. What are we going to do to safeguard the diversity of our workforce in future? What are we going to do to safeguard the diversity of nursing practice in future as the pressures externally try to narrow it into one type of practice with the occasional few in community? If we don't maintain the diversity of nursing practice, there will be nobody to train the next generation. There will be nobody to do the research to evidence what we do. And if we're lucky, there might just be enough people to care for us. So as we get to this, I need to ask you, when we think about diversity of practice and diversity personally and professionally, where do you stand? Are you inside or outside the arguments? Do you feel it personally and professionally or only in one sphere, one part of yourself? It's important for me, as a qualitative researcher and somebody who uses mixed methods too, to position myself within anything that I do. And I think if we're working towards diversity leadership and diversity in practice, and certainly as a clinical academic or as an academic, we need to position ourselves for the future. In relation to these two things, diversity and clinical academic diversity, I ask you, where do you position yourself? I did promise you some giants, and I promised you a bit of personal journey. And this is, I think, where we're going to move to now. Because it's important to remember all the, the evidence and all the things that I've talked about so far around the policy, around the research. They're all personal stories too. One of my first giants who I've not listed here because I have to keep changing the list all the time because I, 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 I restrict myself to so many. So if somebody comes on, somebody has to come off. And one of my giants I had from about the age of six, seven, was Marilyn French, who wrote The Women's Room. I first read The Women's Room when I was seven. I think I first understood it when I was 19. Um, and she talked about the personal being political. And so for me, I think my personal and professional journey is the political point, as it is for everybody. The things which get to us, the things which make our lives difficult or the things that make them easy are often the political issue that needs to be addressed. 
So in the same way about the diversity in practice, that is the issue that we need to address to conserve our, our future. So let me share some of my giants with you. The first are my parents. My parents came to England in, well, my dad came in 58 and my mother came in 62. They came from the Caribbean island of Dominica, which is between Martinique and Guadeloupe. It's not the Republic. My first language is therefore French Creole and not English. And this picture here, apart that's my that's obviously my parents, but the other picture is the beach just outside where my parents' house is still in Dominica. You can see that the sand in Dominica is black. It's black volcanic sand. You can see there are no palm trees on the beach. It's mainly other mangrove trees. And the reason I show this to you is because it is a Caribbean island, but doesn't fulfill the stereotype of what people believe the Caribbean to be. So I think doing things which were not what people believed you should do was probably inbred in me right from the beginning. My parents' view for me was very much, and you know, I'm a family of seven, you be the best you you can be. My dad once told us he doesn't mind if we're road sweepers as long as our streets are the cleanest we can make them. And so very much they came to England in order to give us an opportunity for further education and for development. My father left school when he was 12 and my mother left school when she was 10. And the reason for that is my father at the age of 12 left because he had to work. There was himself and um, he was one of eight and they needed the money. My mother left school at the age of 10 because she was the eldest of nine and her father died when she was 10 and she had to leave school to work. And that's where they started. So they're the first giants with me really to reflect how important it is to actually move on, have a dream and actually go for it. So for me, this whole thing has always been about, okay, where am I going with this? Well, what am I doing? which has led me to research. I was a very inquisitive child. I, I learned to read when I was five. And by the age of seven, when I was reading Marilyn French, I was reading six books a week. And that's mainly because we couldn't afford anything apart from a free walk to the library. So I just worked my way through and read. Um, and when I got past the children's books and they wouldn't let me take any more books out, my dad used to go with me and he'd take the books out that he couldn't even read in order that I could read the books. So research for me was part of like asking questions as part of my persona. And for me, it's important that research is always a cyclical activity, as I've said. You're as good as your last, I was going to say your last failed application, but I won't say that. Okay, so it's a cyclical activity, visiting and revisiting the past and our past endeavors in order to make assumptions and test out and move forward in the future. And that's kind of what I do in life. I'm reminded constantly about the view, the, the George Santana, a philosopher who actually said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Which links me back as a reminder to the point that I made earlier about remembering a time when people were excluded overtly and hoping as we look across the pond again with one eye that we're not moving back into that, that time. So I want to talk about, I'm not in any of these pictures, I have to say, I'm not in this picture anyway, just in case you're scouring and thinking, which one is her? Okay. Um, talking about my training at the time, I think I was very fortunate to do a nursing degree way back in the 80s. I actually had a place to do medicine, which many people don't know. I went to the open day after I'd got the place, spent the day with these medical students and thought, I don't want to be like these people. These are not my people. And at the end of the day, because in the, those way back days of those who you can remember, the UCA forms, you, we, got the, we got a place, in, I got a place in medicine and then you were invited to the open day. There wasn't this trail of open days for what seemed like a whole year before. And so I'd already got the place, went to the open day, I won't say which medical school it was, had this day been shown around by these medical students. And at the end of the day, you were wheeled into a big room where there were six consultants in about behind a big desk 
and they said to you, right, what speciality? We haven't even started. What speciality do you think you might do? And I walked to the desk and I just said, I've changed my mind. And they were all absolutely just looking at me gobsmacked. They said, but you've got a place at medical school. And I said, I know, but I, nah, I've changed my mind. I don't want to do it. I think I'm going to do nursing. Well, you should have heard the gasp in the room. Right? And I just walked out. Now, when I got home, I had to explain to my parents, who I'd always said I wanted to be a doctor from about the age of five or six, to explain to them why I'd finally got the place and then changed my mind. And it was just, it didn't feel like the right thing. So I don't regret it. The last words that the, per the consultant said to me as I left the room was, just remember, young lady, in years to come, you could have been a doctor. And I do remember that. So, but for me, I enjoyed doing the program. But being one of the few, I think, uh, black students on the course, one of the things for me was around, I felt a lot of the time I was holding my breath. Not with the tutors and certainly not with my, my friends and my peers who were in there but with some of the information. Because very rarely did any information men mention anyone who had my experience or looked like me. When we talked about care of patients, skin care, pressure area care, what someone looks like. I remember a particular lecture talking about signs of shock. And I remember them saying, the person goes very pale and pink. And I was sitting there thinking, and when are they going to say anything that I might vaguely, you know, people are waiting for me to go pale and pink. I'll be long dead by this time. And so transcultural nursing, as it's called now at the time, didn't even have a name. And it was very prob problematic. I still think it's problematic now. I still wonder how many students know what to look for if I was to collapse. I wonder how many of you would know what to look for if I was collapsed. I wonder how many students know how to notice early signs of pressure breakdown, a pressure area care in people with black skins. I wonder how many people know what eczema even looks like in a child with a black skin. So it's still problematic now, 34 years after I started and 30 years after I graduated. I was very disappointed with the NMC review of their, of their skills and their clinical um, measures. The competencies still say that transcultural or diversity care is a recommended thing in a curriculum. It's still not compulsory. How in the 21st century can we still say not learning about diversity is not compulsory if you're going to care for people across a range of a population. The giants that I link here were giants of nursing. They were all women who actually stood up and did something different in their nursing. Felicity Stockwell, I remembered from my training. She wrote the paper, The Unpopular Patient. And it was the first time I, that I remember reading any, anything that someone had talked about nursing that didn't say we were angels and had all seen some kind of vision. Felicity Stockwell was the first nurse that I read who was brave enough to say, sometimes we don't like our patients. And to me, she humanized us as nurses. And so she's my giant for that reason. Edith Cavell and Mary Seacole, both nurses of wartime, they stood up and did things that women of the time were not supposed to do. Edith Cavell gave the ultimate sacrifice at a time when people felt nurses and women doing nurses were just the soft handmaidens of the doctor. But all these women identified for me the importance of standing up and standing out and sometimes that not necessarily being a bad thing. So from that point, I was holding my breath for a change. As if things were not difficult enough, my clinical area of choice was sexual health before sexual health was called sexual health. I remember working as an outreach nurse in HIV and AIDS when we didn't even have the word HIV, it was just AIDS. I remember the icebergs. I also remember families behind those icebergs who had their houses firebombed, children who were excluded from joining in holiday camps because someone believed that someone in their family had AIDS. 
people who lost their jobs or refused mortgages because they belong to a group that we called a risk group. This is what happens when we don't recognize the difference within people and we hide behind the sanitized laws and don't think about the human beings. The giants that I've listed here are those people who stood up for something and said no more, enough. They're also the ones that stood up and said how difficult it was for them trying to live in an area where they were labelled because of their diversity, their sexuality and their difference. And all these people here reminded me that in the times when it was difficult, in the times when I was working as an outreach nurse, and in the times when people sometimes refused me to care for them because I was black, and therefore they wanted to know whether I was a member of the risk group and where I travelled to before I gave them care. This is why it's important for us to remember it's not just about the patients, it's also about the workforce and the population. And sometimes sex, lies and morality reflect the problems that we have in our relationships as human beings. Moving on from those people, as I grew, what I learned was, in holding my breath, it was important, it was increasingly more important to speak. The giants that you have here are all people who actually decided to say no more and to speak. And not just to speak, but actually found a way to be heard. Kay Hall, for those of you who are thinking, who's that? Is that somebody famous? Kay Hall was one of my PhD supervisors. She wasn't a nurse. She was from education. She couldn't stand the sight of blood, as she kept telling me all the time. But she researched the experience of Muslim girls in girls' school and asked the question, were they more political if they were in no girls' school to if they were in a mixed school? And she was the one that got me to think about were things different for me researching in my own community as researching elsewhere? Sometimes It's hard sometimes to stand out and be the one in the group, but I'm comfortable in that scenario because I'm used to it it's much more difficult to not be the one in the group and still stand out in that scenario. And I'd like to flag up for you two of these um, giants in this list who I think actually epitomise for me what diversity leadership and being a clinical academic that makes a difference actually mean. The first is Kate Granger, who I was fortunate to meet many times over the last 18 months and actually got to know a little. Kate, as you know, died earlier, a couple of months ago, age 34, as a doctor, and actually recognising that how little people remembered the person behind the patient in her experience. And even the physician who told her she had incurable cancer couldn't look her in the eye. She started a national and what is now even moving to an international um, scheme around the importance of speaking and the importance of introducing the human relationship with patients and clients. Hello, my name is. The second person I want to flag up for you is Fanny Lou Hamer, who is, again, isn't a nurse. You'll see between them there's, a, there's an equal chance that neither of them are nurses. Okay. Fanny Lou Hamer was an activist at the time of the American um, Civil War, not Civil War, the American independence and the American drive for civil equality. Fanny Lou Hamer was born with learning disabilities. She had mild physical disabilities, but she campaigned to be recognized not just as a black person, but also as someone with a disability with rights and the civil rights of everybody else. She coined the phrase you've probably heard, sick and tired of being sick and tired. And for her sins of protest, she was raped many times, she was attacked, she was beaten and arrested. But what she has in common with Kate Granger is, both of these said, we need to be heard. And both of these stood up and led, not for, just for themselves, but actually for other people, so that other people could be heard. And I think that then leads me to what drives me now around diversity leadership, and certainly as a clinical academic, and leading in my sphere of work. For me, clinical academic leadership is about being a candle. 
In the words of Jan Fishan Khan, the candle is not there to illuminate itself. It's not enough if you're a truly clinical academic leader to champion your own career progression, to revel in your own, the things you have achieved for yourself. Surely be proud, because you must be proud of your achievements. But like a candle, unless you shed light for somebody else, unless you actually, by being yourself, allow people not just to see you, but to see the room in which you stand, then actually, once the light goes out, you illuminate nothing. You make no difference. That's leadership of a time, not leadership to actually make any change whatsoever. And the giants I've listed for you here today are all clinical academic leaders from now, from here in the UK, and from overseas that I have met. All of these people did something to advance clinical academic careers, even without the title. Advancing their work as healthcare professions, professionals, they're not all nurses again, but also advancing the ability and the opportunity for other people to have better lives and to have better career opportunities. And if you don't know some of these, I would suggest you look some of them up. You may know Udi Archibong from Bradford. You may well know, I hope, Elizabeth Anionwu, the nurse who's responsible for the fact that we actually have a sickle cell service at all in the UK. Dr. Cecil Cyrus, if you don't know, is based in St. Vincent. He's a doctor who actually was trained in Ireland and actually he spends quite a lot of his money and his time not just giving care, but setting up health and um, health training and health facilities for people within the Caribbean who can't afford, and like my parents, left school long before we would even compulsory consider it. So here I am, 30 years and counting. I don't think I'll quite make 125. And I think in this slide, I've just summed up some of the key headlines from my experience so far. From you could have been a doctor through to doing my PhD studies, um, Interestingly, when I was at school, and I finished school, I remember going to the careers teacher, the infamous career teacher that everybody had, who said to me, what do you like to do? And I said, well, I, like, I would really like to travel, and I really like reading. And she said, ideal job for you, driving a mobile library. <laughs> Absolutely true. So, uh, which I even considered, I even looked up librarian studies, I think, at some point, anyway. So, move, move, so much of my movement from the start of my training as a nurse, from holding my breath in those lectures, has actually been about finding myself and actually enabling other people to speak so they don't have to hold their breath. And that led me through developing the concept of screaming silences, which is now pu I've now published within a, a theoretical framework for conducting research called the Silences Framework. And to now just before Christmas, last Christmas, becoming an, an ambassador with the Equality Challenge Unit for the Race Equality Charter for Higher Education. I think that will be very interesting. I wonder, as I reflect, whether as many universities will be going for the Race Equality Charter as went for the Athena Swan. Time will tell how many people will, uh, will get it. Okay. So, in terms of waiting to exhale then, you might ask yourself, am I still holding my breath? I'm not quite sure. I think I'm letting it out little bit by little bit. So I put a question mark about the waiting to exhale. I don't know when or if I'll be able to completely exhale, hopefully before I stop inhaling at all. Um, but I think that for me, the importance of all this can be summed up in, in, the, in the phrase that I've put up there, my, and this is my own thing, thoughts. I think it's important to think about diversity leadership and clinical academic careers, the diversity of practice, really, because how we learn about things and how we learn about and experience and respond to health issues, whether they're health issues focused on patient care or on the workforce, they actually shape ourselves as, as human beings. They shape us personally and professionally. And I think ultimately they shape the society in which we live and the one that we contribute, certainly as educators, to create for the next generation. And so finally, I want to leave you with the words of Audre Lorde, who 
died young, I think she was 37, 38, and of breast cancer. And she wrote this when she was thinking about her experiences in those last few days of living with breast cancer and the importance of not only speaking, but the importance of diversity. So I'm going to read this for you because I think it's a good end to what I've got to say. The women who sustained me through that period were black and white, old and young, lesbian, bisexual and heterosexual. And we all shared a war against the tyrannies of silence. They all gave me a strength and concern without which I could not have survived intact. Within those weeks of acute fear came the knowledge. Within the war that we are all waging with the forces of death, subtle and otherwise, conscious or not, I am not only a casualty, I am also a warrior. So what are the words you do not have yet? What do you need to say? Perhaps for some of you here today, I am the face of one of your fears. Because I am a woman, because I am black, because I am myself a black woman warrior poet doing my work. Come to ask you, are you doing yours? Thank you.